Hi, everyone. Hi. Give a wave. No, a wave back. My name is Yusuf Omar. I've been a journalist for about 11 years. I covered the Syrian Civil War. I used to work at CNN International. And I'm going to talk to you today about a technology that is going to fundamentally change the world. And I'm not talking, oh, and I'm not talking about AR, AI. So, oh, okay, I'm giving it back to mommy. He's more shy than I am. Let me bring him up here. What's wrong? What's wrong? You okay? Say hi, everybody. All right, so if you have a baby that's born in 2023, if you have a baby that's born in 2023, basically by 2028, they will be in kindergarten. Kindergarten in 2028 is an incredible world. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, incredibly customized education. But outside of those kindergarten walls, We've got flooding, like we've just seen in Libya. We've got mass inequality. We've got the, house, we've got the housing crisis and the uh, economic disparity only increasing. Jump forward to 2041, and this is actually the picture of what he might look like. Now your kid, or Noah in this case, hello. Now Noah is leaving high school, wants to get a job. But most of the jobs that exist today don't exist in 2041. And most of the jobs of 2041 don't exist today. Humanoid robots have taken over so many of the jobs that we have, and the rest are all artificial intelligence and general AI. So what kind of a work will we be doing in that industry, in that world in 2041? And meanwhile, Noah is saying to us, you knew about climate change. You had all the data and information before your eyes, and yet you spend more time innovating on like smart fridges that buy oat milk instead of looking at the glaciers and how we can protect them. Jump forward to 2063, and maybe he looks a little bit more like me than his mom by this stage. Now he's 40 years old. He's 40 years old. Space travel is as mainstream as planes are today, international travel today. And we're discovering different parts of the universe, but we still can't find a place quite like Earth. We still can't find another home to what we already have. Jump forward to 2085. Now Noah is retiring. He has Neuralink. He has connections going directly into his brain, connecting him to the internet. Can you imagine? And those connections are thin as a human hair. They go through our skulls. But yet, he's using the internet to basically escape into a virtual reality instead of confronting the real one. I'm not telling you these stories to scare you. I'm telling you these stories because we need to act now. We need to innovate now. We need to change now. If we're going to deal with these sustainable development goals, there are incredibly complex problems, which some of these incredible young people are going to talk about trying to address. To deal with those, we need very innovative answers. AI is great. Put your hands up if you've heard the word AI at one of the events today. Right? AI, 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 AI. AI, AI is great, and it's going to change the world. But there is another technology that is gonna fundamentally change humanity and every single person's lives. What am I talking about? I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about augmented reality. The ability to do these funny things like these little effects, right? You've all seen them, the flower crowns, the doggy tons, let's make them into a little balaclava. Oh, right? I'm talking about augmented reality. Now, you're probably wondering what on earth does this have to do with the SDGs? How are we going to change the world using face filters? This is ridiculous. Who is this guy and why is he holding a baby? Augmented reality is the idea of overlaying the internet onto the world. And it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And I hope by the end of this presentation, you are too. We use it every day. It's selfie filters are AR. Pokemon Go is AR. All these objects that we overlay onto our existing world. In 2016, I first realized the potential of this technology. I used face filters to hide the faces of rape survivors in India so that they felt they could tell their stories without being recognized. You could use augmented reality for incredibly meaningful purposes. By 2025, 75% of the world's population 
will use AR, augmented reality, on a regular basis to inform their consumer purchases, to be able to look at soil and understand its quality. Now, 2030 is a really big year for everybody, right? Especially everybody in this room. 2030 is when a lot of these climate deadlines are being reached, where if we don't make a change by then, we never will. 2030 is also a really big year for technology. I believe by 2030, every single person in this room, and remember the statement, will replace their will replace their phones with glasses like these. By 2030, every single one of you in this room will be wearing a computer on your face. It's a fundamental shift in technology. With these computers right now, I can see directions around New York City. I can be chased by a zombie while I go for a run. I have information overload, overlaid onto my world. Now you're probably thinking, why do I need that? That sounds awful. It sounds like a casino on your face, all right? It's not. Good augmented reality is subtle, useful information when you need it most. In fact, the phone is the worst thing ever. I'm walking around New York like this, or I'm looking at my son, but I'm looking at him through a screen. It's not very nice. I've been wearing these devices for 11 years, trying to understand how we can use this technology in the context of the SDGs. And that's why I founded a company called Scene with my founder, Samaya. We have 65 staff around the world in the US, India, South Africa, all over the world, I'm based in Australia. Now, how does this help with the SDGs? How do we use this AR technology to deliver on the SDGs? When my wife was pregnant with little baby Noah, we wanted to track the kind of fetal development week on week. We were able to create AR filters that overlaid the fetus onto her body, see how we developed week on week. Now, I really don't want Noah to become an iPad zombie. Who knows those iPad zombies, right? Kids that are obsessed with their iPads. So I'm developing AR tech where through the world, through the glasses, he can see shapes and colors and identify objects around him. Noah and myself, I'm a Muslim. I think he is, I'm not sure yet. I pray in Arabic, but I don't understand one word of Arabic. I created an AR effect where we can overlay the, uh, the Quran in English to understand what you're reading. In South Africa, where my wife is from, there are colonial statues all over the cities. You can scan the statues and they come to life and they tell you stories and they say, oh, I was a fantastic general. And then the horse wakes up and says, no, you are a racist, right? This is how you can innovate on healthcare. This is how you can innovate on education. This is how you can innovate in this case, in history. In the city of Boston, we've taken thousands of historical images and overlaid them onto the city. So you can see the first woman, Catherine Switzer, to run the Boston Marathon, and you can hear her story. This is how you innovate on gender equality. And one of my favorite examples is part. Climate change is hard, and it's really hard to pay, make people appreciate natural environments. We created an effect where you open your camera, you look up at the sky, and you see a battle take place between Mother Nature and greed. And Mother Nature loses and greed wins. Then you meet this koala bear named Albert, and he navigates you around the natural parks and encourages you to take pictures. And what you're actually doing is collecting data. This is how you innovate on data science. Now, I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to say that there's a fundamental opportunity. This is a plea, this is an ask, this is a hope to invest in innovation, not for us, but for Noah, for Noah's generation. Thank you so much. Founder. Another hand of applause for Yusuf. So like Greta Thunberg says, there's been a lot of blah, blah going on. But now it's time for action. And the young people, the people that become our future, are going to share some great innovations. Sitting here today, you're going to turn into a bunch of judges who are going to judge innovations that have to do with the SDGs. But before I get into that, my name is Mandara Shaka. I'm from the Global South in South Africa. I've had the great privilege of working with the SDG network, uh, the UNGC network, global network in my home country. And as I've listened today, I'm really excited about what the future holds. Except that we're kind of back in crisis mode. Time is shorter and we have to move faster. And I think it's time the older people give room to the younger people so that we can do the heavy lifting. And the program that we're gonna showcase to you is a program that finished some five years ago. 
by the Global Compact. And this program has run successfully in most of the countries. And we're going to give you a sample of what that program can do so that when you go back, you can encourage companies in your home country to sign up for the accelerator programs that the UN Global Compact runs, more especially the SDG Innovation Accelerator. So we're going to be putting uh, the different countries one by one in front of you. Uh, there's going to be for you to vote for your favorite innovation. As you vote, I have been working with these different teams, and I want you to think about three things that you will rank them on. Think about how innovative is their solution. Ra rate them for innovation. Rate them for implementability, because innovation that is not implementable is as good as paper that cannot do anything. If you write an idea on paper and you leave it on a desk, you're going to find it there. So implementability is important. And then rate it for scale, for impact. How much can it change the world? So think about those three things. And as you vote, please rank them. And some of them will bring you to tears. Some of them will excite you. Most importantly, every single one of them will teach you something. So without further ado, I'm going to invite the first team to come up on stage. And I hope that the tech team will also give us the, the code so that we may be able to uh, vote tech team. Is that OK? Can we, can we get the, the code? Thank you. So that's the code. Please put it into your phones and maybe have a little uh, school, school card that you are running. Make notes. And in the end, please vote, cast your vote properly. Thank you very much. So without further ado, I'm going to invite the team from uh, Brazil, iFoods. Please come up. Inequality is an undeniable part of Latin America's history. Exploited for centuries, there is still the massive challenge of building a better society. The legacy is tremendous, but if so, what is the role of gig economy? Well, iFood is the biggest food delivery app in Latin America with 70 million orders per month. For years, this business as usual has been made by motorcycles, but we still have three major challenges that we must face. The first one is economic. Fuel represents 25% of the delivery costs. Efficiency need be a must. The second one, it's about environmental impact. High food carbon emissions become come basically by motorcycle. Offset is a choice, but we are going further. The third challenge, it's about social impact. The rise cost of fuel and vehicles are barriers for drivers, uh, particularly those, those who know more opportunities. Individuals without nor, with, without jobs, without education, without driver license, and opportunities. And that would be find on the apps they start to reintroduce on the works. In order to face these challenges, we have created a food pedal, an unprecedented project that offers drivers major discounts on electric bicycles rentals. Since there is no need of the fall, we can disrupt economically and environmental challenges when we find that 60% of the roads are short and that data intelligence can predict the best areas to share the e-bikes. The social impact comes when extremely affordable subscriptions, no license required. Anyone can start with equivalent to $2. It's simply 1,000 times cheaper. Further than the bicycles, the program aims to change futures, and only by offering educational programs we can change, for good, the bottom line of this problem. And that's what we did. Over 22,000 people subscribed and made over 15 million orders using electric bikes. David 
is one that subscribed when he was unemployed and homeless. I foot pedal was his first step on change. Currently, he makes three times the minimum wage. If I foot pedal could change his story, you must believe that there is a powerful future which not only on our side, but also on our side. Thank you. Thank you very much. I forgot to say uh, the presentations are timed for three minutes to make it fair. So you don't have to hear us go on and on. We said no blah blah, so we will have no blah blah. So the next team. <laughs> The next team is from the United Kingdom, ISG. Uh, Poppy, Kajol, Oliver, and Rosie, please come up. Clock starts now. As a global construction company, we build data centers. Data centers are an essential part of the modern world. They to work from home, use cloud data storage, online shopping, AR, cars, social networking, and so much more. There are currently 8,000 data centers in the world and demand is growing at such a pace, the need to build more will only increase. And they are very energy intensive. It is predicted that by 2050, data centers will account for 20% of global energy demand. Now the future we imagine is one where this infrastructure also powers our homes and our communities. Data center IT agreement operates 24 seven. If you think how hot your laptop gets, you can imagine the heat these buildings are producing. In order to operate efficiently, data centers need to expel, waste, expel heat as a waste through the roofs of these buildings. In some instances, energy is lost up to 98% in this way. In the context of a global energy crisis and rising fuel poverty, data centers are a fantastic opportunity to capture, reuse, and redistribute otherwise wasted heat. By installing, closed loop energy systems or connections to community heat networks, we can provide vital energy for communities and businesses alike. Data centers can become part of a more sustainable energy ecosystem. The solutions are out there. The technology already exists, it's just not being utilized at scale. We are here to bridge the gap between the tech experts, the clients and the developers that we work with. Now to improve client buy-in, we have partnered with Brunel University London, who are going to be undertaking a research study on one of our live data center projects, where these different waste heat capture technologies will be tested. The outcome, a first of its kind digital model, which will show how these different technologies will work and the quantifiable benefits that they can provide our clients. We've already seen the impact that this new approach can have on one of our real life data center projects. We've been working with a team in the UK to connect one of our data center projects to a local university and two hospitals. And the waste heat from that data center is now gonna be transferred to actually power those facilities. This is just a small scale example of what can be achieved through better collaboration and understanding of technology. But let's imagine that we could roll this out on a global platform. We could be connecting data centers to power community facilities and homes across the world. Moving forward, we're gonna need more data centers to power all of our digital lives and our solution will drive this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job back there with the mics. So when you're presenting, please stand here. There's a clock down here so that you don't get cut out, but well done. The next team that will come to present is PTPLN Perso from Indonesia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Indonesia is the Southeast Asian nation with almost 17,000 island earning it called named Archipelago Country. Papua is island is one of the biggest island in Indonesia. Currently, there are 37% area that haven't got electricity yet in Papua. With a huge island tourism potential, the geographical topology of Papua is still has a challenge for the construction and development of its supporting transportation. Here we are, it's the one of the villages in Raja Ampat, Papua. 
with majority livelihood as a fisherman. Without electricity, the fishermen have to cover 60 kilometers only by ice cube to the city to their store the fish. Some airways residents have a personal generator. However, they have to pay six US dollars early for six hour electricity. This situation has prompted PT PLN to take a part in pursuing the strategic step to order and achieve this 100% electrification ratio in Indonesia. We several compare we compare several technology that can be applied to provide electricity for rural areas and Yarwesser Island as the pilot project. For a community with 30 households, SuperSun is 50% lower in investment cost than diesel generator or communal solar power plants and 10 times lower in operational and maintenance costs. SuperSun users only spend 9 cents per kilowatt hour or around 12 cents to enjoy 24 hour electricity. Again, it's 10 times more affordable. SuperSun is a compact personal hybrid power plant that uses green energy like solar, wind, and microhydro integrated with PLN prepaid energy meter supported by smart DC grid interconnection and smart energy management system that easy to install in just one week. Our company, PTPL Persero, collaborate with the local government to provide SuperSun for free. So the community only have to pay for the electricity that they use. Also, they can monitor the performance of SuperSun through the application. The implementation of SuperSun cover eight SDGs impact. The community in the rural area have access to store and process their food. So no more hunger and no more poverty anymore in the rural area. Also, we can improve the quality of education by having electricity available for 24 hours a day. The Super Sun is innovation that can be duplicated and developed in frontier, outermost, and disadvantaged area in Indonesia. We hope not only Indonesia but also around the world. Super Sun, lighting communities, changing lives, giving hopes. Terima kasih. It's going to be a tough job for the judges. I don't want to be you, but I'm really, really keen how you're going to rate them because it's, I feel like a parent, so I don't really want anyone to win, but there's going to be a top three, so please listen carefully. The next group, John Kills uh, Holdings from Sri Lanka. Siri Awati is a mother of two from a town called Kuala Nava in Sri Lanka. Kolo Nava, incidentally, is also home to a beautiful and diverse wetland habitat filled with a host of endemic species. And they together combine to create the unique cultural and ecological heritage of Sri Lanka, also known for its pristine beaches. However, over the years, a series of invasions have taken over to disrupt what could be a beautiful story. Invasion in the form of poverty has taken over the lives of these simple yet hard-working people, making each day a struggle. Invasion in the form of water hyacinth has taken over the local wetlands, creating floods and threatening the lives of native species. Plastics have invaded our oceans, causing disruption to coral reefs, marine lives and more. Our solution to this problem is to make a potential enemy our friend by making water hyacinth, this invasive species, our resource or raw material. How so, you may ask? Well, we will harness the ingenuity and creative talents of communities such as Siriyavati to harvest and utilize this invasive species, water hyacinth, and transform it into a host of unique products ranging from slippers and baskets to tape boxes and more, which in turn will be directed towards local markets such as retailers and hotels, with export markets too a very viable option, which in turn will provide at least a secondary source of income for communities such as Siriyavati. Most importantly, however, these products will be conceptualized, pitched and delivered as an alternative to single-use plastics and non-biodegradable items, through which 
we will be able to prevent over 8,000 kilograms of non-biodegradable waste from reaching landfills and water bodies. Over 65 kilometers of wetland habitats will now be better preserved with flora such as patana reed and bamboo, as well as fauna such as kingfishers, herons and water monitors, now being given a better habitat to grow and thrive. Over 120 beneficiaries from locations such as Siriyavati's will now have a primary or at least a secondary source of income, while over 9,000 families that are currently affected by floods in the wetland areas caused due to heavy rainfall coupled with debris such as water hyacinth will now potentially be protected. And so, though our solution may seem quite straightforward, we are truly encouraged by the impact it can create. Together, we can move forward faster. And from all of us here, from Sri Lanka and John Keels, are you... Thank you very much. Uh, the next team is Penti from Techie, and your three minutes will begin as soon as you start talking. Thank you. Everything is in place in the world, and the earth has a unique and balanced way of living. This is the ideal when we let the world function in its own way but we leave traces in the path. As a ready-to-wear retail company, each year we create 420 tons of fabric waste coming from our pre-production cutting processes. These fabrics are not used for anything and they become our waste that we leave on Earth. In the first phase of our project, we will build partnerships for change. With a recycling company as our business partner, we will start collecting fabric waste from our suppliers and include them in the recycling. In the second phase, we will start collecting second-hand panty products from our customers in our selected stores. The ones available for recycling will be recycled to the yarn and then to produce fabric for panty. The ones that cannot be recycled will be used different parts of textile sector under the carpets as filling materials for the toys, etc. The recycled fabric will be used for panties new products, so instead of using raw materials and demanding for more to produce, panty will be using its output as an input. It will be a closed loop, a circular business model. For the first products, we have designed a shopping bag, as my friends shows right now, from recycled materials from panties own waste. Uh, it will be an alternative for our customers to use instead of plastic and paper bags, so it will be reusable as well. The whole operation will be done in Turkey. Our supply chain is almost 90% local. This is one of the details that will make this project different. Instead of uh, spreading the whole operation across different continents, we will uh, lead it locally. Also, we will generate employment for women in the value chain. This is one of the challenges that we have. There won't be any dyeing process and chemical use. This will be a huge partnership between us, our suppliers, and the recycling company. Thanks to the project, our waste will be in their place. Thank you. I think the judges are sweating because, well, it's not an easy task you guys have. Who best? You decide. The next team is going to blow your socks off because their name is Blufa from China. And they are talking an innovation that I think you're going to like as well. Come, Yang Zhou. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Bo from Blufa. As you all know, plastic has indeed no doubt brought benefits to our daily lives, but we are now at a turning point. The world is choking on plastics that cannot be degraded for hundreds of years. And every year, more than one million marine animals are killed by plastic waste. And we humans eat, drink, and breathe in over 74,000 microplastics a year. And that cumulative effect could be toxic, let alone the huge amount of carbon emissions from producing and incinerating plastics. So, do we have a way out of the plastic crisis? Ladies and gentlemen, 
it is time that we put plastic behind and adopt safer, cleaner, and healthier material that can benefit us now and in the future. And this is when our material, blue fat, comes in. It's a kind of a biopolymer that naturally exists in nature. And we at Bluefa have successfully found an industrial way to mass produce it. With similar properties to plastics, it can be made into almost anything you can imagine. Just check the screen. Under this pro program, we have developed all these prototypes and more. And what's the most incredible thing about Bluefa is that it comes from nature and reaches nature. For example, you can dispose this drawer made from blue fat at home compost or industrial compost, or even if it leaks into nature, it can still biodegrade into carbon dioxide and water within several months. And it's safer for humans and animals, even if we accidentally ingest it. Moreover, there will be no fossil carbon emissions when incinerating it because it's 100% bio-based. Technically, one ton of plastic replaced by blue fat can lead to the reduction of three tons fossil carbon emissions. And now, imagine that impact with 5,000 tons of capacity annually or more. At the same time, we have also developed a technology that can combine carbon dioxide and renewable biomass as feedstocks to manufacture blue fat. And pilot test results show that nearly 10% of the carbon atoms in blue fat come from air carbon dioxide directly. And we're working on increasing that percentage. Thank you everyone, we're blue fat from China and it has been an honor for us to be here today. Just do come and see me up. Mike. I'll finish that for her. Come see her out, outside so that you can sample her product. <laughs> All right, the next team is Beit Al Amna, House of Trust, Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, so today, we all aspire to champion the SDG agendas. But deep inside, we need to ask ourselves, how sincere are we? We need to reflect on whether we acknowledge the SDGs as the guiding principles that drives our project or just a mere chat box to be ticked for recognition. So in the Malaysian think tank industry, there is a need for a more sincere integration of SDGs into research and advocacy projects. There are three key issues that underscores the problem. First, first issue is that the stakeholder, okay. the first issue is that research projects often la lack sufficient stakeholder involvement. Therefore, sometimes, our research is confined to our desk that it misses the real understanding of the ground. Second, there are not enough effort to produce simple explanation of our research findings to the public. Therefore, our work is seen as complex and very hard for the people to understand. And on the other hand, there are not enough collaboration within the think tanks itself. So it is undeniable that with a robust collaboration within the think tank industry, we risk fragmenting our efforts and resources. Ladies and gentlemen, our solution to this is a guideline to build collaborative sincerity in sustainability policies, a three-pronged approach. So the first step for us is to connect the concerns of stakeholders. Oftentimes, stakeholders are not on the same page when they do not, uh, they are not aware of the concerns or opinions of the other groups. And therefore, informed decisions cannot be taken place. Second step is to bring together our fellow peers to collaborate on policy. As my colleague has just mentioned, there isn't enough collaboration between Malaysian think tanks. 
By coming together, we can collate our resources and ensure greater accountability, protecting future policy from greenwashing. Finally, it is to partner with our fellow stakeholders and peers to advocate as a collective group to the Malaysian public and Malaysian policymakers. Through this, Bait Alamana hopes through our guideline to improve the outlook of sustainability in Malaysia. We want it to be informed, sincere, and purpose-driven. We hope that the reliance of KPIs as a motivator falls away so that a genuine and sincere take on sustainability can take place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Get out your tissues. You finally have an opportunity to hear from someone who lived through the war in Ukraine and how their solution is helping rebuild a tall, a war-stricken country. I present to you Interpipe Ukraine. Vera, over to you. Diversity, inclusion. These words keep gaining volume over the years all around the world. Interpipe is truly committed to those principles in all sectors of our activity. However, what do you do when life puts you face to face with another challenge that is more tragical and horrifying? 573 days, year and a half. This is how long Ukraine struggles with the war. 45 million population losing their basic right to live peacefully. 11 million of them relocating for safety. 950,000 called military. Around 1,000 Interpipe employees called to military service as well. Every 10th employee. That was a hard lesson for us. But we learned how to keep going under duress. We created a corporate center inside the company to help every mobilized employee with protective gear, tactical uniform, medicines, food and hygiene kits for refugees, and medical equipment and consumables for local hospitals. Now we feel strong enough to make the next step full reintegration and rehabilitation of those directly affected by the war. His name is Yuri. He is still making his vacation. He has a family of three kids and a wife. He likes fishing and collects watches as a hobby. He served his military duty in the hotspots of southern and eastern Ukraine. He took part in battles for Kherson and Bakhmut, and after release from his military service, he returned to his profession, but tete -a -tete, he claims that he is ready to serve another term as the war will last. For him, and other veterans who will come back to their workplaces, we created a corporate center with a program for reintegration and rehabilitation for every and each one of them. Combining comprehensive and individual approach, we offer our employees medical and psychological support, mentor guidance, legal advisory, and occupational training, sometimes even re-education. Almost 47 veterans already entered the program. And right now, we think that as the war progresses, no one should be left alone. That's why, in the framework of SDG Innovation Accelerator, we designed a model for reintegration that we want to scale up on the biggest scale of our hometown, Nipro, to the brighter future together. Thank you very much. So I'm going to slow it down intentionally. Uh, there's three teams left, and I'm going to do an ad break for the program. The program lasts eight to 10 months. The people that you're seeing here have not been trained to speak like this. These are people who are ordinary uh, people in companies that have registered, and now they're so proficient in innovation and speaking about the SDGs. So do you guys agree with me when I say the future belongs to the young people and we can definitely do this work? I hope you're convinced. 
The next team is MFI MBC from Georgia. Hello everyone, I'm Guan Su from Georgia. I'm representing Microfinance Institution, MBC. Today I'm going to share with you the project which aims to empower women-led small and micro businesses in Georgia. Uh, when starting working on this project, we identified the barriers women face when they start businesses. Uh, there is a huge inequality, gender inequality, when it comes to access to financial and non-financial services in Georgia. Uh, first of all, this challenge is um, uh, uh, related to the factor that there is gender inequality when it comes to property ownership in Georgia. For example, 60% of men acquire property as uh, uh, the inheritance of gift in Georgia when it comes to women, the same figure is just 20%. Also, when it comes to taking entrepreneurial risks, they fear to take those uh, entrepreneurial risks because the society and families are less tolerant when it comes to uh, women. Uh, so based on these barriers, we decided to create the solution which combines financial and non-financial services to women entrepreneurs. Uh, first of all, we designed the loan product, which is tailored to women entrepreneurs, which means that we considered the property barriers, uh, ownership barriers to women entrepreneurs, and we're offering unsecured loans to 10,000 US dollars to uh, women entrepreneurs, which is exceptional for Georgia. Also, we're negotiating to investors to offer them um, uh, interest rates, affordable interest rates, but at the same time, we think that uh, um, women empowerment and financial inclusion is not just uh, um, uh, owning some loan or uh, just running the business. We believe that it's uh, uh, more about ensuring that those women definitely have the knowledge and confidence to lead the business. So we decided to create leadership program for women entrepreneurs, and we are offering them trainings and mentorship programs when it comes to business skills, soft skills, and financial literacy. Um, at the same time, um, when creating this solution, it's very important to make it vital, right? So we decided to, um, okay, sorry, I just, uh, uh, yeah. So we decided to uh, have this vision, future vision, how we are going to uh, run this program. Um, first of all, we are going to raise the investment. We already have uh, the first investor when it comes to financing women entrepreneurs. Also, we are going to issue gender bonds. We will be the first medium-sized company in Georgia who uh, uses the gender bonds as investment uh, instrument in Georgia. Of course, we are going to diversify we, uh, our product when it comes to financing women entrepreneurs and we are going to match those products to their needs and Thank you very much. So if your business is not innovating for the SDGs, if you're not creating products, the UNGC has a solution and a program. It's time to cut the blah blah and it's time to act. The next company is from my home country, South Africa, Umgeni Water. We are still a long way to go towards the attainment of SDG 6 and the targets we have set for ourselves. And South Africa has been experiencing an increased number of electricity blackouts, which have set the smile even further. Umyani Water Utuela has been unable to treat wastewater that comes into our wastewater treatment plants during these blackouts, which has led to sewage coming in and leaving the wastewater treatment plant as it is, leading to raw water um, entering these streams, causing environmental pollution and other health implications on humans. Ladies and gentlemen, the solution we present today is Isibani Esisha, which is new lights. Piloted in one of Umgeni Water's largest wastewater treatment plants that receives 100 megaliters per day, we have proposed a three-phased approach towards energy self-sufficiency, where in phase one we say, you cannot control or solve what you cannot measure. 
So we will be looking at installing strategic smart metering devices in all our major equipment so that we can get to understand how much we are using, where and when. Phase two involves the reuse of methane, which is currently fled to atmosphere. Methane is a byproduct of wastewater treatment and currently we use just a small portion of it to heat up our boilers. So we will be looking at using this gas to produce electricity and adding renewable electricity and renewable solar energy and coupling that, providing self-sufficient energy utilization. We find ourselves in phase three, which is where we're looking at the future and the potential of the solution. We will install that excess electricity back into the grid. Ladies and gentlemen, and the careful implementation of this project and the solution will mark a turning point for South Africa and the water sector at large, where we can find South Africa getting back on track towards the attainment of the SDG goals. Thank you. I am proudly South African. I'm beaming with joy and pride. And I hope the votes might be biased towards my home country, but it's a good thing that I could don't get to vote. So it's up to you guys. Finally, we are wrapping up. So I hope your notes are becoming copious and you are sweating as you decide who your favorite innovations are. I call to the stage Sempra Infrastructure Mexico. Hola, buenas tardes desde México. Please close your eyes for a second. Imagine yourself living in darkness, no running water, your children using a candle to study. This is energy poverty. And there are thousands of isolated communities living like this, not even knowing what electricity is. According to the UN, one in 10 people in the world lacks the access. That's around two times the US population. And on the other hand, the world is disposing a huge amount of usable solar panels. Today, most of them are stored and then discarded as waste, and nobody is addressing this matter. Typical linear industry, produce, use, store, and dispose. So the world is generating a new waste problem. And truth to be told, as you can see, it's growing exponentially. So to handle these apparently unrelated issues, we came up with the following solution. Three easiest steps based on a circular economy model. We're convinced this is scalable to other countries. Hopefully, yours too. So first, we identify commercially obsolete panels from running solar farms. Today, most utility scale plants discard a significant number of panels that are still operational at 70% of the lifespan. Step two is to energize communities that suffer from energy poverty using or extend the life panels. And by focusing on the children's basic needs, we will improve these communities' long-term living standards. Our panels will power social development projects, including water pumps, streetlights, community centers, and schools. We've estimated that Mexico discarded enough panels to power 1,400 of these projects, and that's only for this year alone. We will also be working alongside communities, helping them operate and take care of the panels until they're completely worn off. Finally, we will recover the panels, recycle them, and reintegrate them into the production value chain, effectively closing the loop while creating a win-win situation for the planet. We flew from Mexico full of hope and excitement, willing to share this project with all of you, wishing that you will fall in love with this solution the same way as we do, and take it back to your countries. Together, we can energize the future of those who need it the most. This project goes far beyond bringing electricity. It is about the children, dreams, education, and new opportunities. The time is now. Let's build together a brighter and a more sustainable future powered by the SDGs for the benefit of generations to come. If you felt a connection to what we just presented, please raise your hand. Wow, now look around you. We expect we have sparked the same passion we have for this project, and we welcome you to join us in this journey to disrupt business as usual. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Now, judges, tally up your scores and get voting.
because we have to announce the top three. As you are voting, I've got this to say to you. We've got seven years or less left towards the achieving of the SDGs. We have demonstrated that you can take everyday people like me and you and have them work on solutions for your company. Not solutions that are charities, but solutions that can be profitable to the bottom line. That's how we're going to achieve the SDGs. So I hope that you will go back and you will challenge your local network, your companies in your countries, and potentially the universities. If you think, so, so earlier I was sitting next to someone from Harvard and someone from Cornell University, and I thought, imagine if this module was taught in university. If you think that that's something that you would like in your, in your country, can you please raise your hand? Because I think this should be taught in every university and children should have the opportunity to do what these innovators did. Please raise your hands. Thank you. I hope you've taken note, the people from the UN Global Compact, we need to get Sanda to speak to the right people so that the uh, education institutions can have this program implemented there. So according to your voting, are you still voting? Okay, more voting are coming, more votes are coming. Uh, you need the code, okay. Um, no, no, we, okay. The, the website is slido.com. The code is 459 Yes, please vote. Um, can all the innovators stand up? Because I'm going to announce the winners. So all the innovators, please stand up. The votes are coming in. Damn. Okay, keep voting. Okay, I'm going to count down from 10, and then I'm going to announce the winners. 10, 9, 8, 7. Count down with me. 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one. Can I get a drum roll? There's the top three. So Mexico, please come up. You are our number three. Number two, Indonesia. It's EPLN Perso. And number one, Brazil, iFood. Thank you very much. Yes, Indonesia, number two. Where's Indonesia? So this is number three. Can, do you have someone taking pictures for you? Okay. <laughs> take the picture. Okay, wait there. Let, let's, let's, let's take the picture and then, please wait there and then. Thank you. Okay, please stand here. We're going to take a group picture. Indonesia. Please stand here. We're going to take a group picture. And finally, the top team, according to you, the judges, Brazil's iFood. <laughs> All right, and finally, please stand here and let's take a group picture and another round of applause for all our winners. Please come to you. Group picture. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you very much. So the future is in our hands. So please give us the young people room to innovate. It will help your company retain the young talent. They definitely are interested. They are eager to learn and they are eager to develop solutions. Thank you. You have been a wonderful audience and a wonderful bunch of judges. Give yourself a round of applause.